The Ishtari, the wizards, come from the undying lands across the great water. Like the elves, we can taste our immortality. We come here to Middle-earth in this middle time, the now, from the future, to assist in the unwrapping of the present. A big gift that is this immortal life of this, our spirits. Filled as it is to the brim with love and laughter when rising to its best. And even in the depths of darkness and despair, it is the remnant of that great gift of life that yet animates any orc-like residues in our nature. There is always hope, a penetrating ray of superlight illuminating the way that brings us back home again to our source, in whom all healing, restoration of life, and fulfillment of divine purpose is not only possible, but assured if we but offer up our grateful assent. Let it be done according to thy word in this kingdom of the divine will, as earth is in heaven. Take me, Lord, for I am already yours. You are all powerful. Make this humble hobbit one of your saints. Tolkien's Symbolism in the Lord of the Rings Tolkien wrote, Myth and fairy story must, as all art, reflect and contain in solution elements of moral and religious truth or error, but not explicit, not in a known form of the primary real world. Letter number 131. Our real world contains much enculturated unreality. What is real is true. The truth sets us free of enslavement to limiting ideas and the practices which naturally flow from those ideas, just as culture flows from beliefs or the operational model of this creation that we imagine ourselves in. In fact, this imagining or imaging process from the seed-like enfolded two-dimensional sphere of our brain's neocortex can bring us into a fifth and final level of personal coherence with our source, of which we shall say more later, as the soul, soul gateway to the three other transpersonal levels akin as they are to the three persons of the triunity of the Godhead, the source of all value, summit of all meaning, and circumference of all grace, which flow in this life like so many pads of butter melting on freshly baked bread. We are made in the Creator's image, after all. One of these insights in the human's scientific conception is that, that of creation as a holographic process. Our multidimensional world may be accurately described by a mathematical projection of space-time from a two-dimensional sphere, which is the mere surface of the mind of God. How godlike then, and thus in accord with our intended role in the divine commerce, that our friend, shall we dub him Tolkien, Sir J or St. John of the Shire, has created a world of Middle-earth in his imagining, and as the superlight beams of our consciousnesses cross upon the two-dimensional realm on which his ink strikes the fiber of that luminous fiat of blessed paper, the darkness of ink sends forth ripples of communication, the word incarnating itself upon our very souls as another world, but another world born of a viable soul in this one, a brother of our hearts, a fellow son of God. And Middle Earth is nothing if not a multidimensional holographic creation from a two-dimensional domain of the word. You see, by our nature, we are truth. We can truly say, I am. I am that I am. Sometimes I think, therefore I am, Always. Identity is coherence in time. It's just that thinking limits identity. I may think I am my body. 
I can think I am my mind. We think we are our social value. I think I am all that is mine. Or I think I am this gift of my soul. I think I flow from the sacred center of my heart. I think I am love working itself through by grace. I think I am grateful for all that all that is. I think I am one cell in God's body. At the time of Tolkien's birth in South Africa, his mother and father were members of the Anglican Church. Due to concerns for J.R.R. Tolkien's health, mother and child, children traveled back to Birmingham, England. His father remained in South Africa to tend to business. Soon after, his father caught rheumatic fever and died when J.R.R. T. was eight years old. Tolkien wrote, Christianity has played an increasingly important part in Mabel Tolkien's life since her husband's death, and each Sunday she had taken the boys on a long walk to a high Anglican church. Then one Sunday, Ronald and Hilary, his brother, found that they were going by strange roads to a different place of worship, St. Anne's, Alcester Street. In the slums near the center of Birmingham, it was a Roman Catholic church. Mabel had been thinking for some time about becoming a Catholic. From Tolkien's biography. I myself was raised in the Catholic Church, essentially spelling universal with a lowercase u, Episcopal Church, and many years later joined the Episcopal, run by the Episcopate, the Bishop's Catholic Church. If capitalization were a proper attempt to claim status as a noun rather than an adjective, as was the custom in the not-so-distant past, then which, I ask, is higher? A king who is sovereign over a vast domain in which the king, this king is subject only to the creator, or a kingdom so vast that there is no foreign power but only its king of kings to serve. Do not both serve the same master, and according to their staying true to their natures and their service, as they come closer to their source and truth, so shall they come closer the one and the other. Quote, the Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. That is why I have not put in or have cut out practically all references to anything like religion, to cults or practices in the imaginary world. For the religious element is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. J.R.R. Tolkien, Letter 142. And so, it must be in the truth of this world, Middle Earth, that it is. If religion stays only as an exterior adornment of this life, it is dead, though pure white as a sepulcher. Only when intentional practice eventually makes perfect and gives way to spontaneous action, and then acting to continuous contemplative doing, and doing in time to loving service, serving to the radiant gift it is the full presence of being. Does the mind release its reign on the soul in these stages, allowing a certain inner sanctuary of quietude and increasing spaciousness of freedom from the incessant worldly expressive vibration of the worldly reverberations of the word to make way for the unfurling of our elvish qualities of receptivity to the inner language of our nature? as sons and daughters of the divine. That must be how the extra acute ears arrive. As Mother Teresa said about her prayer life, I mostly listen. And when asked about what God says to her, he mostly listens. Tolkien. It is a monotheistic world of natural theology. The 
odd fact that there are no churches, temples, or religious rites and ceremonies is simply part of the historical climate depicted. It will be sufficiently explained if, as now seems likely, the Silmarillion and other legends of the First and Second Ages are published. I am, in any case, myself a Christian, but the Third Age is not a Christian world. Letter 165. And from Letter 195. Actually, I am a Christian, and indeed a Roman Catholic, so that I do not expect history to be anything but a long defeat though it contains, and in legend may contain more clearly and movingly, some samples and, or glimpses of final victory. Such references or windows on our future self are also seen occasionally by grace in the process of accelerated self-healing, and the accelerated personal and spiritual growth that healing the biological vessel of the soul affords. One of the frequent ways such a state of grace appears is when by elvish science of listening and communicating with the body vessel, the requirements are met with volunteers from any of the kingdoms of the plants and the spirit of the flowers, the minerals including the precious condensates of the spirit realm, and the animal kingdom including our own photoenergetic makeup with biologically active activated minerals, ions and vitamins in their cofactor forms, amines, including their many forms as laser-like communicators such as hormones and amplifiers including enzymes, sugars and other rings as carrier vessels, armor and crowns of light and spirit. Indeed, all the angels of our higher nature are divine design. Quote, but only one's guardian angel, or indeed God himself, could unravel the real relationship between personal facts and an author's works. Not the author himself, though he knows more than any investigator, and certainly not so-called psychologists. I was born in 1892, and lived for my early years in the Shire, in a pre-mechanical age. Or more important, I'm a Christian, which can be deduced from my stories, and in fact a Roman Catholic. The latter fact perhaps cannot be deduced, though one critic by letter asserted that the invocations of Elbereth and the character of Galadriel as directly described, or through the words of Gimli and Sam, were clearly related to Catholic devotion to Mary. Another saw in Waybread, Lembus, the Viaticum, and the reference to its feeding the will in Volume 3 and being more potent when fasting, a derivation from the Eucharist. That is, far greater things may color the mind in dealing with the lesser things of a fair story. Letter 213. And from letter 310. So it may be said that the chief purpose in life for any one of us is to increase according to our capacity of our knowledge. God, by all the means we have, and to be moved by it to praise and thanks. To do as we say in the Gloria Excelsis, we praise you, we call you holy, we worship you, we proclaim your glory, we thank you for the greatness of your splendor. The Shire represents home. I was born in 1892 and lived for my early years in the Shire in a pre-mechanical age. Tolkien. Its verdant green is the physically balancing quantum energy of which we can never get too much, whether in our diet or in the feasting of our eyes at the Shire. Hobbits and their triune nature. Hobbits represent the saints. As saints in training, they are halflings, with a soul half animal of this middle earth and half transcendent of the undying lands. Unless ye be as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hobbits are a blend of the races of men, of the dwarves, and of the elves, and thus come variously dominated by one of those three spiritual shades, the dark to azure blue watery hues of men, the warm earth tones and shiny metallic colors of the dwarves, and the radiant and transcendent superlight that is the fire of divine love center, which is the home and the heart and the fire in the hearth. As 
hobbits or saints in training, we all work with the issues of healing, the foundational mineral nature of our dwarf like bio body suits, the bridge like human nature which links the earthly body and heavenly spirit, and the angelic nature of our elvish soul itself. Dwarves. Dwarves represent the angels of the mineral kingdom as well as spirits of greed. Known for their skills in metallurgy, they also touch upon the knowledge of the Arkenstone, the heart of the Lonely Mountain, that glows blue as orgone energy from the Book of the Law, the Philosopher's Stone. It may be that the Arkenstone was one of the three Silmarils, the greatest achievement crafted by the ancient Elvis science. If so, it traveled 500 miles underground, a feat in no way impossible for a gem that is a superfluid super vessel of non-local divine consciousness. In Tolkien's Middle Earth, this crystal made of silim, silima, containing the last light of the two trees of the first age, Telperion, the silver. set in the sky as a star, and the third resides in the waters of the sea. In the real world, Middle Earth, one of the two books of the law is in Ethiopia. The location of the other is yet hidden, as is the angelic vessel of the Ark of the Covenant itself, and the rest of its contents, the golden pot that had the bottom, Aaron's rod, buddy. are drawn to live near the water, just as the ones with more dwarf blood live under the earth, and those with more elders' natures inhabit the forest. As hobbits, we are the land of all three, but it is the human slice which is the meat in the sandwich. Between the earthly minerals of the body of clay of Adam and the heavenly body of shoe bread, the bread of angels, Connie's of the Oriental, the human stands in the center of the trigram, with heaven above and earth below, symbolic of our triune natures. Elves. Elves represent angels of the plant kingdom, wood elves, and of water. Such willing and giving allies we have in the hosts of botanical extracts and tinctures, the homeopathic medicines, flower essences, and essential oils, of God's the elves to me speak of the higher angels of our nature. Our guardian angels are transcendent future souls, which being more real and alive than we await only our invocation, our invitation to join with us in perfecting our thought, word, and deed in the present. Thus manifests the contemplative inner life. For example, the Zen conception of the not doing of doing, when we step aside and allow the divine order to act through us. About orcs, Tolkien writes, With regard to the Lord of the Rings, I cannot claim to be a sufficient theologian to say whether my notion of orcs is heretical or not. I don't fall under any obligation to make my story fit with formalized Christian theology though I actually intended it to be consonant with Christian thought and belief, which is asserted elsewhere. Letter 269. Orcs represent fallen angels, angels of past damage not yet fully healed. And our mistakes we haven't learned from yet. Orcs and every character in the Middle Earth of the mind, like the characters in a dream, ultimately express some aspect of ourselves. In the case of the orcs, as selves who have been tortured so long they have forgotten their true angelic nature, they stand for every wisp of damage we carry, fossils of an imperfect past, which is so necessary in order to know healing, and ultimately to come face to face with perfection, and not miss the opportunity, the gift to fall deeply and irrevocably in love with our divinity. 
This is the supreme hope, the ultimate possibility, the divine potential that is ordained from beyond time, where we are already as we shall become in the fullness of time, space, and whatever other gifts of love are held in the mysteries beyond our ken. It is our destination, our destiny, our predestination, which on occasion, with the practice of opening ourselves as ever freer conduits of grace, we may glimpse as a pre-membrance of the greatness which is imminent and yet to come. These reference points in our experiential landscape typically only last but about three days. But in three days, much can and does happen in the spiritual frame. Christ resurrected in three days, and thousands of people have experienced spontaneous remissions of deadly diseases like cancer, typically in three days as well. Goblins. Goblins represent fallen angels and spirits of gluttony. We heal them in ourselves with spiritual nourishment, God's body and blood, which is in the life of the plants and animals we incorporate as our food. Life is precious, delicate and fleeting, and yet so resilient it survives three generations without some life in food. Three generations and no more. The human scientist Pottinger observed this with his poor cats. The humans know this to be expressed in the activity of the enzymes, but few yet suspect that there are other nutrients in the living cell that may be incorporated into the vessel of the consciousness, the spiritual body itself, that navigational vessel which may know the life of the eternal. These are the elven minerals, the eleven elven minerals rumored through the ages. Sauron represents the Illuminati, who have their all-seeing eye above their pyramid, one of the two towers. And Saruman represents the Freemasons, who always wear white gloves as part of their ceremonial dress. The Freemasons are the other tower. In fact, the two towers feature prominently in the Freemasonic lore and practice. Waybread. Lembus represents the Viaticum, the Eucharist, the Lamb. This waybread feeds the will and is more potent when fasting. In the history of the real Middle Earth, Lamas, or Loaf Mass, is the occult feast of the wheat harvest on August 1st. Aragorn represents the king of all Christendom. Aragorn II, son of Arathorn, Strider, Isolder's heir, ranger of the Dunedain, last of the Numenorians, king of Gondor, symbolizes the rightful heir to the crown as human king of the Holy Roman Empire, France, Germany, Great Britain, etc. Prophecy among the humans speaks of the return of such a king in our own times. And here in the real Middle-earth, such a type of king we do have, in King Kali'i. Of the other, in Europe, I anticipate word may yet come from France, perhaps about a certain ranger from the north, so mostly I listen. Galadriel, Tolkien writes, I think it is true that I owe much of the character of Galadriel to Christian and Catholic teaching and imagination about Mary. Galadriel is a type of Mary, fully human, yet perfect daughter, spouse, and mother of the divine. Our Holy Mother, our mediatrix of all graces, by inheritance, by fiat, by divine gift. The greatest gift possible for us, opening of an earth embassy and heavenly bridge, a starport to the undying lands through the bridge that is the non-local union of the sacred and blessed hearts of the mother and the son. Gandalf. Gandalf represents Christ who returns in glory. Thus Gandalf faced and suffered death and came back or was sent back, as he says, with enhanced power. But though one may be in this re reminded of the Gospels, it is not really the same thing at all. The incarnation of God is an infinitely greater thing than anything I would dare to write. 
here I am only concerned with death as part of the nature, physical and spiritual, of man, and with hope without guarantees, writes Tolkien in letter 181. I am your Glendon, and I am at your service. But enough about me. There is much pressing healing work to be done if we are to mend our minds and restore the fullness of our heart to our hearts. And now, at least until we turn a new leaf, I will bid adieu. And as we are fond of saying in these parts, if I don't see you in the future, I'll see you in the past.